Thank you very much for joining us today. We are discussing backroom to boardroom, careers off the pitch, because all of you here today who wanted to, to take part in this session will want to either know how to get into football yourselves, if you're in it already, how do you progress, where do you go, what do you do, and this wonderful panel of women are here to tell you exactly how to do that and how they did it. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Faker Others. I'm a freelance broadcaster. Uh, I work predominantly for TalkSport. I'm their England correspondent, um, so it's been a busy 12 months, 18 months, um, etc. I'm missing tomorrow because I've got to go up to St George's Park to do the men's squad announcement, which is very frustrating because I wanted to be here for all the women's game stuff, so I'm very jealous of those of you who are staying for the next two days. Um, really looking forward to this session in particular because getting women into football and, and careers across the board is something I'm really passionate about. I, I myself was lucky enough to uh, get an MBA, um, uh, get a scholarship to study an MBA via women in football up at the University of Liverpool um, in football industries. And so many women who were on that course said to me, the biggest problem I have is I've never worked in football before, so how relevant am I going to be? How difficult is it going to be for me to get you know, into a job in football. I said, no, 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 football needs you more than, more than you think because there are so many people who work within football that need to know how other industries work and how important that is. Um, and actually, if that is one of your worries about how you get into football because you have no football experience, do not worry about that. And these wonderful women are going to be able to uh, tell you a little bit more about that. Obviously, over the next two days, the plan is to kind of inspire you as much as possible, but not just the next generation of women in football, those of you new to the industry, uh, anyone joining later in their careers as well, which I know many of you already have done. And as Yvonne said at the beginning, the, the plan is to empower you uh, to take control of your careers, um, meet as many people as you can over the next couple of days. You know, I know some of you, the faces here already, and it's brilliant to see you all, but don't just stick with the people that you know. Go and introduce yourself. See what advice you can get. These fantastic women are going to give you all of their advice. I'm going to let them introduce you all, but uh, uh, I'll tell you who they all are first and foremost. So Hannah, we haven't met before, so I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you. Hannah Dingley is the Academy uh, Manager at Forest Green Rovers. Uh, Rachel Pavlou, Women's Development Manager for Di Diversity and Inclusion at the FA. I mean, what she doesn't know about women's football in particular, but football in general uh, is not worth knowing. Uh, Sarah Batters is Director of Marketing and Partnerships at Southampton. And Bex Martin is Director of Sponsorship, Strategy and Planning at Barclays. Um, but I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves and tell everybody exactly what you do. We're, we're going to start with you, Bex. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, yeah, looking forward to being able to share a few stories, hopefully, to be able to um, give some advice. But yeah, I'm, I'm Bex. I work at Barclays. I've actually only joined in November, although I was at the bank 10 years ago. Um, but I very much in the sports industry have worked from brand side, so like the Barclays No. 2, but also agency side. So some of you will be familiar with Fuse Sport and Entertainment. So they're an agency that acts on the brand's behalf to kind of bring the partnerships to life, um, as well as sort of doing the negotiating of deals between brands and the rights holders. For example, when we say rights holder, we mean like a Southampton or the FA. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, as I said, sort of sharing stories with you. Um, I'm also on, on the board of the European Sponsorship Association. Take a mic, your mic's not Thanks. working, Vex. I can okay. hear you. I don't know if this is working. I, oh, yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> um, I'm on the board of the European Sponsorship Association. I'm also a trustee of something called the Change Foundation, which is an amazing organisation. So if you don't know about them, please do look them up and I can try and share a bit of information on that. So, um, so yeah, Barclays currently for uh, um, three months recently. I can't take any credit for the amazing work that's been done in women's and football, though I'd love to. Um, but I'm looking forward to, um, yeah, getting more involved now I'm there. Hopefully I, I your mic. I think Sarah might need the mic because yeah, she's holding hers. Mine, <laughs> mine fell off, so but there it seems to be working. So. As well, are you going to hold it like that? We'll, fi we'll fix it in a, in, in a sec, but you hold it like that for I'll now if like it works this. for you. So yes, hi everyone, my name's Sarah Battis. I'm Director of Marketing and Partnerships at Southampton Football Club. Um, also mum of two little girls who, who both play football and as we were just talking about, I'm also a coach of uh, under seven Wildcats team, um, the Chipstead <laughs> Flamingos. Where we've got quite proudly 28 girls under seven and a waiting list. 
so we just need more, more coaches. Um, so my role at Southampton um, is, is my first role in football, so I used to be kind of more client side in, in corporate kind of marketing, branding roles. Second so thing, the mic switch. <laughs> um, and I moved into football three years ago. So my, my job at Southampton is obviously on the partnership side, looking after and acquiring all our commercial partners for the club. Um, and then on the marketing side, it's about all of our commercial revenue streams, but also, more importantly, our fan growth. So making sure we've got a sustainable football club, um, attracting young fans, um, making sure we keep our existing fans despite league performance, which uh, obviously is a bit of a challenge for us right now. Um, and, and then also um, into me is all of our data and research and analytics teams. So making sure that everything that we're doing at Southampton is very data-driven um, and getting the best results that we can. So, yeah, that's, uh, I think, a summary of, of my background. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Pavlo. Everyone calls me Pav. I've worked at the FA nearly 25 years developing women's football. That's why uh, I'm old. Uh, but, um, <laughs> and I know things. I didn't say you were old. <laughs> um, I am currently, currently focusing on um, developing opportunities for underrepresented communities in the women's game, um, which I'm absolutely loving. Uh, so I get to work with national, regional and local agencies um, who can help us to provide opportunities that perhaps weren't there before. So great projects um, around um, working with Asian and black women, uh, working with uh, refugee and asylum seekers, um, LGBTQ plus communities, older women like myself, um, um, and, and, and lots of other organisations that we work with and, and other people. So yeah, I've got a fantastic role and I really enjoy it, but I have done for my whole 25 years. So lots of things that I've done over the time, but the one I'm doing at the moment, I'm particularly loving. Excellent stuff, Hannah. Um, so my name's Hannah Dingley. I'm the Academy Manager at Forest Green Rovers Football Club. So um, football coaching is my background. Um, I, again, as we've discussed this morning, really didn't have those opportunities when I was a young girl wanting to play, so I went into coaching and had a career um, mainly in, within the men's game with coaching sort of uh, men's non-leagues team. I did have a spell at, in the w, WSL uh, with Lincoln City before they folded, um, but generally that's been my pathway. Um, and then my job before going into Forest Green was at Burton Albion where I was head of coaching, so again designing curriculums, um, and I looked at it and I thought, I can run this, so went on to um, lead the whole sort of academy at Forest Green, which is the boys' programme. Um, all the way up for eights to up to under 23s um, into progression to the first team. Okay, so I'm sure there's going to be a wide variety of people here at the moment thinking, okay, that's a, that's a bit of me, that's, that's what I want to do or that's what I'm doing. So the question is, how do you get into it in the first place? I think there's a lot of people wanting to know that. With 25 years experience, Pav, go on, how do you, how do you even start off? Uh, well, like most of you, you prob probably thought I really want to do sport, so I knew I wanted to work in sport, so I went to a university in order to do a sports course, so I did recreation management, um, and as soon as I came out, I was looking for a job, but so was everybody else, um, and so I started off in a sports centre in Birmingham, uh, learning my trade for a year, and then I got the at, the, at that time, the dream job to work in further education at Solihull College, and they gave me the role of sports development officer, and I worked there for nearly six years developing sport um, for, for 16 to 19, which I absolutely loved. And luckily, while I was there, people were asking me to go on coaching courses, so I did my football ones. And when I was on my football one, that's when I got the love for being involved in women's football. And I was very lucky that I had a mentor uh, stroke uh, advocate in, um, in a guy called Tom Stack, and he just said, you need to volunteer in women's football, and I'm gonna help you to do that. So I did lots and lots and lots of volunteering, because that has to be, for all of you, I'm sure, the way in always is to not just do your job, do stuff uh, as well on the side. So I volunteered in absolutely everything in women's football. So when the job came up at the FA, I was able to show them all, all my portfolio of all the little photographs I've kept over the years of all the things I've done in women's football. And, uh, and I was just so grateful in 1998, when most of you weren't born, that I got the call to say, you've got the job in the FA, and I am the happiest person in the world because that's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. I was definitely born. I was born <laughs> and almost finished university, so don't worry about that. Um, Bex, we, we've spoken on, on many occasions before because actually um, you love sport, but you haven't always worked within sport. So how, how did you get into the role that you're doing now and the ones that you've done previously? 
Yeah, so actually, um, I at university did psychology degree, and then I did my teacher training, and I taught adults with learning disabilities for a couple of years. Um, I also learned how to sign, so I was working with kids with Down syndrome and trying to give them communication, sort of um, therapy, to be able to uh, learn like core life skills to um, have a more normal um, sort of way of living. Um, <clears throat> I then really wanted to go and specialise into educational psychology, so I applied to do my master's, um, but then that one-year master's changed into a four-year doctorate, and there was just no way I could afford to pay for another four years of education, um, plus also, uh, you know, just it wasn't a particularly well-paid um, industry that I was in at that time. Um, so sadly, one that I absolutely loved and, and would love to, you know, pursue, but have sort of brought it back around into what I'm doing now um, by the opportunities and the programmes and things that I get involved in. Um, but actually, at the time, mine was almost a situation of right time, right place, which I know is very fortunate and not everybody has that lucky opportunity. But um, a friend of mine was opening a sports marketing agency and I was looking for a role. He didn't really want to pay anybody very well because it was a new startup agency. And I was like, that's fine. I, I, you know, I have nothing at the moment and I need to get into something. Always been a lover of sport, played it growing up. Family kind of big, um, big in sort of the sports world as well. Bristol City, by the way, if anybody is wondering what my <laughs> local team might be. <laughs> Ashton Gate. Oh, every we're playing you tonight. <laughs> Ashton Gate every single Saturday. I'm a town fan. <laughs> um, yeah, I was really pleased that Arnold Clark Cup went there a few weeks ago yeah great sell out of the stadium um anyway yeah right time right place somebody was opening and had an opportunity and I took it and from there it's just been one amazing opportunity after the next um keeping kind of your network in place as well I think wherever I've been I've really tried to build relationships and constantly meet people and constantly you know put yourself in slightly uncomfortable situations like being up on stage trying to talk to you all today about <laughs> career things um, <clears throat> but you know it is about building those relationships keeping those networks popping opportunities not being afraid of saying what you actually want because again I think potentially as um, females and sorry I know there's not just females here today but I do think we find it harder to vocalize what we want and we don't quite know how to go about it more often quite apologetic in terms of of saying what we want um, and I think over the course of obviously growing up and getting older um, and finding that inner confidence to be able to say has enabled me to kind of you know make the right moves and have the right conversations and work for some fantastic organizations and have some amazing experiences along the way and as I said now the projects that I'm sort of involved with I sort of trying to bring it back to marrying up that first part of my career around working with people who don't have the same privileges as everybody else um, by obviously in the sponsorship world and the money that brands can able to donate to programs and invest in um, uh, yeah I'm really really fortunate I don't know if that quite answers your question. Yeah, no, I think no, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. I, th I think it's important for everybody to know where we all came from because everybody has to start somewhere and it doesn't matter where you are in your career, beginning, middle, end, you know, if this is a transition, start, whatever it is, you have to start somewhere, don't you? And uh, it's useful knowing. So where did you start, Sarah? <laughs> well, I definitely have a, a, a wiggly path into, into my role. So... Um, when I left university, there, there wasn't really a commercial side of football. Like, it wasn't something that you thought, oh, I really want to go and work on the commercial side of football. The game wasn't at that spot then. Um, so I went off in my career um, actually working in cosmetics and, and fragrances, so probably the most opposite thing you could possibly do. Um, and then at a certain point, um, one of my mentors actually um, was working at the FA, and um, I got a bit of envy, I think. <laughs> and I was like, I want your job. Um, so I just booted, no, I didn't. Um, so I've always, been, <laughs> I've always been very passionate about football, like an absolute football fan, love it. Was, the, was, the, was a little girl watching teams train at weekends, just doing whatever I could to watch football. Um, so I had the passion. Um, but I thought, well, how am I going to convince someone to give me a job in football because I don't have the experience? And, and me and this mentor really actually mapped out what are all those applicable skills um, that I have from, from my experiences so far um, and how they relate to football. And we really was quite structured about it. But I'm so glad I did that because then when there was the opportunity actually came up at, at Southampton and I was able to interview, 
um, I, I wasn't very confident, actually, in the interview, I have to say. So I think for my role, there was a few hundred people applying. I was like, well, why, are they gonna, why am I going to get it when I've not got that experience in football? Also, a little bit of um, insecurity being female, I have to say. Um, and I did know that I was up against males who had done the same role but at other football clubs. So I was very much of a mindset that I really had to put my best foot forward and really demonstrate how everything that I had done outside of football was actually not just applicable, um, but would be a real benefit to bring that kind of outside in view and expertise into football. And, and, and that's something I've been trying to do since I've been in the role is always kind of bringing that different viewpoint and, and how I develop my teams. and also how I bring people into the sport now. So, um, you know, I think an important point was just having the, the support of some really key mentors during the process that I really lent on um, that had done a similar transition. Um, and just, yeah, really focusing on and building that confidence in, yeah, what can I bring, not what I don't have um, got me there. Yeah, that's really important, what, what, what you can bring. But for anyone who doesn't work in football currently and is thinking, well, how do I get in? I do think nowadays in particular, it's quite important to have outside skills to, to come in. But it, exactly what you said, Sarah, having the confidence to do that. And Jill talked about imposter syndrome. I think, you know, it's fair to say we all have that. I don't, I don't want to lump us all in together with that. But I certainly have imposter syndrome and I don't know very many of my... Uh, friends and colleagues and peers who, who don't. And I think it's quite important to actually embrace that and realise everyone feels like that. So be confident and go in. Um, Sarah talked about mentors. Did you have any mentors, uh, Hannah? And how did you come about doing the role that you're doing now at Forest Green? Um, not one particular one that sort of took me through the whole sort of journey. Um, again, very similar to Pav, it was all about gaining experience. And again, going back a long time, I remember writing letters. I had to write letters to clubs to get opportunities to go and coach. Um, I found the qualification pathway helped. So when you can go, I'm an A license, I'm a pro license, it maybe got you through the door a little bit more um, to get those experiences. But I coached every night of the week. So there was a time where I was doing you know, non-league football on a Saturday afternoon, that coached them twice a week, then WSL on a Sunday, and then an academy on a Sunday morning. And any little bit of experience I could pick up, you'd have to pick up. And there were ups and downs. I've been sacked, I've been you know, horrible experiences and really positive experiences. There's lots of ups and downs on that journey. And yeah, really lucky that I was started coaching again part-time at an academy. Um, and that opportunity came up for a full-time role. Um, and again, I was at a club that knew me, so um, obviously got that full-time role, and that's helped me within that. But I had to lock, knock, on a, knock on a lot of doors, <laughs> get a lot of pushbacks to get those opportunities. So I suppose that's how, what how I would say. How do you deal with that? Because I think that's probably something a lot of people need to know, how to build up that, that resilience, because no one likes rejection, do they? Yeah, it's rubbish. <laughs> Let's be honest, it's rubbish. Um, but all you can do is keep going. Um, you know, it, I think your family, you know, the people who keep you grounded, the people who you would always go to support, they'll always be there. They'll always support you, whatever happens. And the thing that I will... This is a really bad story. Please don't put this on the internet. But we, um, you know, we just had a, a new recruitment person. He was in the job for five months. He got a sack, so he was, didn't do very well. He was crap. Just say it. He didn't do very well. He <laughs> was crap. And I sat there and I thought, I could have done that. I could have got sacked after five months for being rubbish, but I want to put myself forward for that. And the more you see that, I think you start to think, well, what's the point? If you don't try, you'll never know. Mm. But there's pl plenty of men out there who aren't very good at their jobs. And no <laughs> plenty of women as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but yeah, you know. <laughs> so put, like, put yourself forward. Give it, you know, give it a go. What you what you got to lose? And that's sort of maybe my mindset as of maybe got a little bit older and a little mm. bit knock down enough times to think actually let's give it a, give it a go yeah because i mean look, there's there's loads of uh, research that women in football have done and, and other organizations as well about the number of men that will put themselves forward for a role that they're not necessarily equipped for versus the number of women if they don't tick a certain number of boxes in the essential slash desired competencies, um, which, which is quite important. But, but we, and when I say we, I'm not excluding uh, the wonderful men in the, in the room and, and, uh, at all, but what I am doing is making sure we as women and men who are allies and non-binary allies as well, 
make sure we lift each other up and say, well, why aren't you applying for this? This is really important. And Barclays is a great example, actually, uh, Bex, isn't it, of, of in, an inclusive workforce and, and promoting women for, for roles that they're good at. What, what kind of other roles are there within Barclays that, that, that people could do? Yeah, I mean, um, we've got an amazing grad scheme, actually, that um, grads who are on that placement can get experience in so many different areas of the business every single six months they rotate. Um, actually, Chloe, I think, is, I don't know if she's in here or a different session, but she joined us this, t um, this week for her final placement. Um, and so I think, you know, from, from that initial intake, but also from the top of the perspective, you know, they really try and retain talent and there's a jobs board so you can go on and you can look across the business. So um, it doesn't matter if you've been in one particular area, say in marketing, but you want to go and work in a more financial facing sort of business banking area. There's lots of different opportunities um, and lots of different um, employee schemes to kind of get involved in. We've got a huge diversity program as well. Um, so they, yeah, I think, again, as I said, I was at the bank 10 years ago and coming back in, it just feels a really um, supportive, progressive, um, amazing environment to be in, actually, um, given it's a big corporate. And I'm sure everyone here, if you are a Barclays customer, you probably may have positive and negative experiences, so hopefully lots of positives. Um, but, you know, it's like any brand. There's um, O2 I've worked, I worked at previously as well. Um, you know, uh, they're a huge supporter in the kind of sports industry, but internally there was lots of different opportunities for you to move around. And it comes back to, again, being vocal in terms of being really explicit to your line manager and other people and just meeting people for coffee. You know, I think there's no harm in understanding, again, like what other jobs are in the company and just asking people to sit down with you and just say, I don't really understand what you do. Could you just explain it to me? Mm. And that's like a great way of understanding what other opportunities there might be out there and just just um, regularly meeting people informally like that, I think, is a really good way of, um, yeah, understanding where you might want to go. And I think one piece of advice that somebody once gave me is when you're in your role, and obviously, you know, you, um, it's always good to have a view on, um, you know, if you see someone to your point about you saw the person at the FA's job that you wanted, um, you know, it's actually really helpful to have that because it solidifies in your mind, like, where you want to get to and who, where you want to be. And I think also starts giving you that confidence to realise, actually, do you know what, I can do that job. Um, so always having sort of a bit of an eye on, I really like you, but just so you know, one day I'm going to have your job. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing. No. It gives you that inner sort of like hunger and desire and competitiveness that I think is important to have. I think it was seen as a bad thing previously because it did very much used to be oh, right, there's one job for a woman. We've got our token woman in the business, wonderful. And so there probably was a competitiveness amongst females in particular that you want to help, but you kind of got to protect yourself at the same time. And I think that is, that is going. I wonder if you've seen, seen that, Pav. Oh, I, I feel really strongly about this. I feel that um, we're here to put everybody above us. Um, and if you don't do that, and I think Jill said it about looking in the mirror, if you don't do that, then you shouldn't involved in supporting women in football you know and women in sport um so we we I, I really feel privileged that I've been at the FA when there was a handful of us working full-time in football as women um and now there is so many people working in women's football it's just unbelievable let alone working in the football space and we went to a conference a couple of weeks ago it's the first time the FA ever had a conference just on women's football staff I was like, look at all these people. It was like, packed. <laughs> like, literally, we were um, like six or seven of us um, at the, at, back in the day. So I think the, the opportunities now for women to be involved in the whole of football, but also in women's football, is just awesome. And the fact you've got a whole conference tomorrow that's dedicated to the women's game is, ju is just really special. And, you know, I'll say to everybody, you know, please help. However old you are, you can help another woman do really, really well. And if we can all, if we all do that, if that's what we all aim for, is to help other women go above us, then the, then women's football and women's sport is just going to be awesome in the years to come. If you don't do that, then I'd really question why you're involved. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I think we're all responsible for, for that as well. And you know, as, as you said, Bex, it's 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 so important. There are so many jobs a, a, across, but. If you go for coffees with people and ask, it's not just helping those below you, help those above you to learn, help those at the same level as you to learn as well, because we can all help, help each other. And I mean, the kind of route one into football would be, Sarah, going to a club, 
like, like you work at. There must be so many roles, though, within a football club that, that people can, can go for nowadays, no matter what your experience is. Yeah, 100%. Um, at Southampton, we've got a staff of around 400. Um, obviously, kind of split between the, the football side of the, of the business and then the, the commercial side. But, I mean, within the commercial team, we're, we're 100. Um, and so thinking about all those different roles, um, you've got everything from HR, HR business partners, obviously finance, accounting roles. Within my team, um, we've got you know marketers, but we've also got research analysts. We've got email um, experts, salespeople, um, and then we've also got our in-house design and creative studio, um, which is also sitting within the club. Before you get to you know our media teams, I've got one of my team over there, Ellen, who's our corporate comms manager, <laughs> and you know we've got so many different roles that really now with football whatever your kind of professional capacity or passion is you can probably you can find that role within the sport now which isn't the same as before um and 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 be able to do you know I feel so lucky every day that I get to do my job in what I'm passionate about and so many people do say to me um do you love football? And I, oh, God, I that could question. not. <laughs> One, I get asked that question. Can you ask? Do you think anyone asks a man that question? Anyway, um, one, I get asked that question, and my, and my answer is also like, "There's no way I could do this job if I didn't like love the game." Um, you know, unfortunately, I have to jump in the car after this because we've got a match tonight. Um, but that's, you know, that's it. I wanted to be here. I want. I need to be at the match tonight. And you know, if you didn't love the game, you'd. Um, You'd go crazy, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> really, for anyone in any capacity, there there are roles, um, and and it's just about signposting them to people, um, and and helping them kind of get there. And, and that's quite an important point, actually. Is is signposting? What can clubs, governing bodies as well, do to encourage more women uh, that, to work in the game? And essentially, I feel, particularly when we're talking about raising people up, getting women in in boardrooms. What would you say to that, Pav? Um, women in boardrooms. Well, I know that I wouldn't have been in the three boardrooms that I, I mean, well, have been in. I'm only in one now, but the three that I uh, have been in over the years, if other people hadn't have come to me individually and sat down with me and said, please apply, because I just wouldn't have done it. And I still wouldn't today. If, if, I, if people don't come and ask me, I, I don't, because I just... Imposter syndrome, it is, it is a problem for us, whatever anybody says. However much you think people are confident, you talk to them, they're not. So I would say to anybody out there in, in this room, you know, always encourage other people to do things that, even if you don't want to, go and get other people to do it, because um, I certainly would not have been on those three boards if someone hadn't have done that for me. And I'm really grateful for the, for the male and the two females that did that in, in the past. So that's, where, that's how I've got onto boards, is other people doing that. Um, I think also you need to see people that you relate to being um, on, these, on these different boards. And you know, for me now at the FA, we have Debbie Huey, who is our chair. We have Sue Hoff, who is um, the chair of uh, the women's board uh, and on the main board. We've got Sue Campbell, Kelly Simmons and Kate Cossington, all representing women on the senior management team of the FA. I mean, how wonderful is that for me to see people that I respect and I really enjoy working with at the top of the game at the FA representing women's football, let alone being women. Um, so because you can see, you then go, yeah, 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 that's great. You know, so I think for all of us, we need to have people push themselves to go on to, to, to the top level to help us believe we can do it, but also to encourage us to do it as well. And um, yeah, thanks to those that did that for me, because certainly I wouldn't have done it. But also change happens from the top and yeah. filters down. So it's, yeah. it's, it's cyclical, really. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about Southampton, a Premier League club, the FA, obviously a governing body. What's it like further down the pyramid, Hannah? Well, there's a lot less people, <laughs> for a start. Um, so we definitely don't have 400 people at our club. Um, but again, it's just a different way of doing things. And a, a, again, I'm you know, quite proud that, obviously, just quite a small academy at Forest Green, you know, we now have female coaches. Um, in the pathway, which we're probably, all the teams we play, we see very, very few, still see very, very few. Um, and I think, I might be going off on tangents here, but, you know, I talk about the coach education pathway, which is fantastic, but 
more visibility, more visibility of female tutors, more visibility. So I did a pro license and I don't think I saw anybody who talked to us on the whole course, which I paid £9,000 for, who looked like me. Wow. Not one person who presented back at me. That was a senior leader in, you know, and they weren't all football people, you know, we weren't all first team managers. There were directors from Google and all these other great fancy things. But there was no one who I could relate to as a female leader in a, a, a multinational or a big organization who was presenting back at me. Or um, when they talked about the data of football, they'd talk about the men's game and wouldn't relate to the female game. And yes, I work in the men's game, but I had a colleague up with the, on the course with me who was working for the FA, who, again, in the women's pathway. And it wasn't really a thought because that course is designed by men for men. So just more understanding more, if there's more diversity at those top levels, or more diversity, then people, might, they might think, oh yeah, you know, because I don't think they've purposely gone out and gone, oh, we're not going to get any women to do that. They've, it's just a, a sort of a subconscious thing. They thought, oh, yeah, everybody wants to hear Steve and Gerard talk. Everybody wants to hear, you know, some of these top managers speak, but we won't, they don't think about the women's game. They don't think about the different diversity within the room because they haven't been in those shoes, they mm. haven't experienced it. So if we can get more diversity of thought, more diversity in these areas, I think it's going to help um, different types of people come through, which is only ever going to help the game or help the organisation, because more diversity of thought, less sort of groupthink. We've all been ex-players, we all think the same way, we all went through the same pathway, you're all going to get the same outcome. If you can get more different people looking at the same problem and trying to find solutions, you might find there's a different way and it might be a better way, and your business might be more successful, or your football club might be more successful, which is what everybody wants, right? Make more money, be more successful. So why wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> exactly, why wouldn't you? Um, I, do, I do wonder sometimes, <laughs> why wouldn't they? Um, in terms of, obviously, commercially, it feels easier and, uh, for, for women to perhaps get into roles, Bex. There are future leaders in this, in this room, current leaders in this room as well, actually. So pick people out, by the way, and go and talk to people, as I said earlier. What's the best piece of advice you would give somebody who is looking to get into football that isn't, or somebody who's already in football but doesn't know how to progress to the next level? Um, just before I answer that, I think one thing, just as a build, I think for, for me, there's, as we're hearing, there's so many jobs from brand agency at the club, in your local club, from like marketing operations, commercial, um, you know, other, ticketing, hospitality. I mean, there's the jobs are just endless. And I think for me, again, I don't know if this happens, by the way, because it's a long time ago, but um, careers advice at college or school or wherever you are, um, you know, there was just none of that ever explained. So how people are supposed to know about the jobs that exist, I think there's a massive piece that we need to do there around educating and going in to capture people when they are, you know, like 16 and educating around what the opportunities are. You don't have to go to university. You don't have to do like sort of what people say may traditional sort of routes up into, you know, there is so much opportunity out there. And I think that that's the biggest thing for me is like, how do we collectively as a group inform younger generations who are going to make that change and make it more diverse and who are, you know, incredibly creative and probably have lots of different points of view on the world. And some of those sort of hard to reach communities like how do we get them into the world that we are all in because um, you know I'm not going to sit here and lie I haven't had a you know fortunate opportunity right time right place and um, but you know there's no, no reason to say that it, that can have happened for somebody else who didn't have that and I think that's the biggest thing for me is like how do we educate about all the roles that do exist in the world of sport because I just think there's a massive <laughs> lacking um, for young teenagers thinking about what crib opportunities there might be. Um, in terms of the biggest piece of advice, um, I do think it is, it's just um, like being hungry, networking, and also being nosy. <laughs> like, <laughs> Journalist. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. nosy. <laughs> but meet people, like, honest, genuinely, people are more than happy to spend time with people to help them. Um, and so I think it is just, don't be afraid to ask the right questions. Don't be afraid to reach out to people and um, ask their advice. Um, 
honestly, all of my jobs, um, I obviously I've had to interview for them, by the way, but most of them <laughs> have come through relationships in terms of it's because I've known someone and, it's, and, so they, and they've been aware that I've been um, willing to look for a new opportunity and um, also don't, try not to burn bridges. Um, you know, obviously, again, keep your network on side. Um, you might not always agree with somebody, but it doesn't matter. Like, healthy debate is always a good debate um, and leave places in a, in a good way position as well but network um, be hungry and be nosy and f like just ask just ask like don't if you've got that sick feeling in your stomach being like I don't know if I should be doing this do it absolutely do it um, and push yourself because I think um, yeah often or not again that imposter syndrome comes in we sit there and think oh I shouldn't be doing that oh I'm not good enough and oh god no they're not going to want to talk to me but actually just put all of that out your mind just do it um, and just see, seize that moment and an opportunity and if you've got something in you that's burning that you think right you know just just go and do it so network be hungry and, and be nosy <laughs> perfect brilliant advice and I'm going to get you to ask questions by the way so as Bex said ask 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 um, ask me when no one else can hear though please <laughs> <laughs> no, no no the whole room is going to ask in a second once I've got a bit of advice from all of you I'm going to put it out to everybody else here and I'm sure you've got plenty of questions to to ask Sarah what's your best piece of advice for people so I think building actually quite a lot on what Beck said um one of my best pieces of career advice is from my mum which is great um and that's that you you can't make choices unless you've got options um, and really for me, that's, uh, you know, explore those opportunities, have those conversations, be curious. And also if you see something that interests you, go for it. Like go and experiment, go and apply for the job you don't think you're going to get. Or if you're not sure whether it's for you, you can make that decision later on when it's an actual choice in front of you. Um, but you can't make choices on what you do with your career unless you get to that point of having those options on the table in front of you. Um, so just to go out and pursue those and um, yeah get over that imposter syndrome and I think you know the way to do that is you know mentors but also just supportive groups of people around you so you know this is I love this conference because look at it like there's a room of supportive people in here that I hope people network with afterwards but surrounding yourself with people who want to lift you up I think is so important because that confidence is what pushes you over that imposter syndrome and helps you get it. Did you did you have a mentor? I forgot to ask you that. Yeah I have a couple of mentors. Um, it's interesting because I, I saw that question on the prep for today and it, it's made me reflect because I have mentors but they're all male. Okay. Um, and so I wondered well why don't I have a female mentor and I think it's because uh, where I need and, and where I value that female support is more in that network. And it's more that linking in with organisations like this, similar organisations, you know, my friends, etc. That provides that kind of female mentorship. Um, but no, particularly kind of work and career-wise, I have a couple of mentors who were um, not in a sport to begin with who've made that transition. And I think for me, that's, that's been more where I found that advice. That's really interesting. But yeah, get mentors. Yeah, me mentor mentors are, are, are key, but the informal mentors are just as important. Yeah. Hayley was talking, we're, we're, we, we have a, a group of broadcasters, friends, people who work in the industry. Nat at the back, hi. Um, mm -hmm. You know, good group of friends that we can rely on, talk to each other, question if, you know, we're, we're second guessing ourselves for any kind of way, have somebody to lift you up. Um, it, it's really important and that always tends to be more more informal, uh, doesn't it? But formal mentors also re really, really important. What's your best piece of advice, Pav? Well, I think I've been listening to it because um, <laughs> we've been talking about mentors. Um, that's massive, I totally agree. I think the fact that all of you are here, the fact you've joined Women in Football, um, we, we joined it right at the beginning when there was like a handful of us. Uh, we had, we had, I remember vividly going to the Wolverhampton Wanderers one where the, in the Midlands where there was about eight of us. Wow. Um, and, and it's just got bigger and bigger. But that has been an invaluable for us to talk to each other and to, and to get contact. So the fact you're doing that already by being women in football is great because you can see leadership courses that you can go on. Um, you can see all the different networking programs you can go on. And then there's things like apprentice, apprentice programs that I think are just fantastic to actually have the opportunity to have a go in different industries. Um, I love the fact that I've seen some FA Youth Council people in the room, some AOC from the Association of Colleges, apprentices. I've seen 
some British universities, colleges, football activators in the room. You know, I'm seeing people who are on leadership programmes already that are here, um, and that is such a great way in because you're actually learning on the job the things that you might want to do in the future. So um, I think I think it's been said. I think you just got to put yourself out there. Um, you've got to believe in yourself, and you've got to find people that will raise you. Um, and if you don't find those people around you, go and find other people. Because they are out there. There's lots of people that want to help, for sure. And there are, because Anna Kessel is in the room, and she's one of the founders of, of Women in Football and doing incredible things. Um, yeah, she's sat right there. So. I was, I was, I was at, we, Wolverhampton, uh, London, and Manchester were the first three. Mm -hmm. And I remember you, Jack, Jackie Oatley, Shelley Alexander, just a few just a few of us and we were all like hello and I remember people actually having the conversation this is really interesting should I be there because should it be out with people working in women's football <laughs> like should, should it just actually be people who work in men's football because we have all the problems and I was like do you want to hear my problems <laughs> about working in women's football <laughs> so I remember just vividly there were so few of us and you know Anna you've got to be so proud looking around the room about how many people are now involved in this organisation and, and are employed to work for the organisation but also the people that are taking the opportunities and I personally I'm, I'm a women in football mentor and I absolutely love it it really means a lot to me that I can be um, and seeing some of them get their certificates last night was just fantastic and let's just keep doing things like this and that's the bravery you've got to if you believe in something and you want to do something you can make the change and that's exactly what the uh, the women who put women in football together in the first place went went and did um what's your best piece of advice Hannah Oh, wow, it's tough going last. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Just to echo the sentiments of everybody, you know, have already spoken. I think get as much experience as you can. Um, get qualifications if you can. I, th I find it a lot easier to go into a room and go, actually... Now I'm a pro license coach, I'm sorry, so I, not say supersede you, but at least I've got, I've got standing to say it. And it's not all about qualifications, but it certainly helps me in my confidence just being able to go, actually, I'm as good as you, or more qualified than you, potentially, um, when you're having those conversations. So, again, lots of experience, qualifications, and then just keep banging on those doors. And it is, and as I say, I've, and I've saying what I said before, but it's rubbish, it's tough, because you get knockbacks and it's not nice. But there is somewhere for you, and there are opportunities out there, and there are good people who are open-minded and you know, will give you an opportunity. you just got to find them. And sometimes that means <laughs> knocking on a lot of doors and getting a lot, lot, lot of knockbacks to find that one organisation or that one person who's actually willing to give you an opportunity, and then you can fly. So keep going. So fly. There are five good people up here on stage, all willing to answer your questions. So I think there's people going around. Georgina's got the... Are you going to take the mics? <laughs> These are the roving mics. Um, so hand, hands up, be brave. And also tell us who you are as well, because that's really important. There might be someone in the room that you think, oh, they come from my area, or, or you know, I'll go and introduce myself later. So don't all stare. Come on, I'm... I'm, I'm I know that this has given you a little bit of confidence the last 50 minutes. There we go, right at the front, down here. Thank you very much, Abby. Uh, hello, my name's Abby. Um, <coughs> I am the Marketing and Media Manager at Non-League Football Club Ascot United. Um, I've only been in the role for about eight months and it's completely new. I kind of talked my way into it, actually. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, is that I don't necessarily have a, a sort of director's role, but how do you think I can influence the football club in terms of their inclusivity and diversity? So I look at the board and we do have women on it, which is great, but because of the area that we are, Ascot is a predominantly white uh, middle class, well, actually probably upper class area. So how can I have an influence on the kind of board of directors and those who are there? Um, to make a more diverse setting for us. Brilliant question. Who wants to take that? I can take it. <laughs> um, I have the same question. No, um, I, it's really difficult. I think the fact that you've even asked the question, you're sitting there thinking, OK, how can I influence the board of directors to make a change that, that needs changing is the first step? Um, it, I, I'd... It's probably something I also question myself every day is how, how can I make a difference to um, and influence my board on, on their diversity um, as well. We've got female members, but still it's not far enough for the same reasons that you've just mentioned. I think it's about, one, it's building the relationships and building that kind of credibility that you're able to, to influence um, and 
coming prepared with the with the facts mm. and the data. So mm. you know, making sure that you're you're preparing a not not a case as such, but having all the data, the facts, the rationale, and you know, a well reasoned argument by someone who is is professional and has those relationships is very hard to to ignore. And it would take you know some people to to ignore that. So. I just I'd prepare that and prepare that case and at the at the same time start building your relationships with them with the people that are on their board however however you can which I know is not always easy but you know having conversations if you pass in the corridor or you know wherever you come into contact I think then makes that a lot easier to go in and you know make that influence and, and try and make a change there but it is difficult, but that's why we're here to do difficult things. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah, go for it. I think that's exactly right. And uh, what I'd also do is try and find a club in your similar situation that is doing it really well mm. um, and, and find that, that club and, and use that as a case study to your club to say, look, look at what's happening here. Isn't it just fantastic? And look what the difference it's making. Can we do a little bit of that? Because I just think everybody um, really likes case studies of, and wants to do better as an organisation, whoever they are, and if they can see someone else doing it really, really well, that helps that person understand what you're trying to do. Have you got an ally, perhaps, that, that maybe has more of an in with the people a bit, a bit higher up, if you like, that you could talk to? Um, I mean, because we're a non-league football club, I kind of know everybody anyway, mm. so I think I probably have that in already. It's just, like you say, the confidence to step forward and say something. Yeah, fi fi find, that, find that person who you think, okay, they're going to understand this and then work out with them how you go about it. Brilliant question. Um, over here, thank you. Thanks, Abby. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Um, so I'm India. I work at We're Fearless through an uh, integrated creative agency. Um, and one thing you mentioned over and over again was the importance of mentors, which I uh, couldn't agree more. I've been on the Women in Football uh, mentoring program recently, which has been fantastic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just wondered how you've gone about finding your mentors and approaching them. Uh, and yeah, what tips you've got for kind of having a bit of a breadth um, of um, interests or, or careers that those uh, mentors have that have helped you? I haven't spoken about your mentors yet, Bex. I actually don't have any mentors. Who wants to mentor <laughs> Bex? Yeah. Um, yeah. I have just always found, and it's actually a, bit, a good question, um, I think coming up through, I've always had really supportive um, bosses. And so at the time, because my career, I have felt, has been going and p pushing me in the right directions at the right points. I haven't necessarily found I've needed that. However, I actually do sort of on reflection wonder if that was the right sort of thing. And also for me, I think mentors have only really in the last few years been a big thing. Um, so um, I have actually recently just reached out to somebody um, and they are um, you know a c-suite person which um, I've been admiring I suppose uh, and it is a female um, I've seen her on panel sessions and I did sort of think she's never gonna say yes like you know she's probably so busy and um, you know she's never gonna have any time and anyway, I did reach out to her on LinkedIn and just asked um, thinking I, we once met you know a few years ago you probably don't remember who I am um, you know doing that apologetic piece that we all <laughs> we typically all do, do. Yeah. Um, and actually she has agreed to it which is just brilliant but I do think you're right in terms of now I've started to think about it it. She is within the sports industry, um, marketing um, specifically, but actually I think it's really important to have people outside of your industry to give you that different perspective on, um, on things. And so perhaps always thinking about, you know, um, your own, shouldn't call them weaknesses, but, you know, if, that, if I was to think about actually what's one thing I think that would really benefit my job that I potentially haven't really ever had exposure to through no fault of anything that I've done, um, what would that be and actually who could be the right person to help support in that and guide um, so it's probably trying to spot those areas where you think god I'd love to either learn more or um, I don't currently have that as my current skill set portfolio um, who have I seen or witnessed out there who could potentially help fill that um, but I do think you're right having a cross-section of mentors and just having someone that they're I mean I would say being a being a mentor is a big job in terms of it needs you need to both invest into it so you need to to make sure the person is right so again I don't think you should be afraid of if you do find somebody as a mentor and after a few sessions you know you're not getting from it 
what you are. You, again, you do need to talk about it and you be do need honest. to vocalise it and mm. be honest because it, it should be a big preparation and a big investment from both sides as you as the mentee and also if you are a mentor, you absolutely need to be doing it, doing that person justice um, by supporting them. So, um, yeah, mentors shouldn't be taken lightly, I think. Yeah, ensure you've got a good cross-section. Um, yeah. That's great. What about you, Hannah? Um, well, I'm really lucky, I suppose, part of um, my role, I'm on an academy manager's programme supported by the Premier League, and we're allocated mentors. Um, but again, it's in similar sort of conversation, I actually went to the Premier League and said, can I have a different mentor? Not because there's anything wrong with one I had, but I was going through a really difficult time, and I really wanted somebody who maybe had that experience in that, you know, in a similar sort of way. And I had to say, is there anybody who can help me? And really luckily, Yvonne, Haverson was my mentor, so oh, really lucky mentor. with that. Um, <laughs> but it was perfect for me at that time because, as I say, going through a really tough time, and I wanted to relate to somebody who had had that, had an experience, say, similar or working in a similar sort of area. So, yeah, that really helped me. Brilliant. Sorry, can I just add? Sorry, um, just because I've got two young kids, a six and a three-year-old, and I think again, going back to the mental point, I think in terms of when your personal circumstances change or you go through different life stages that's also can mean that you probably want different things or may need to look out for somebody else. And um, I think for me in my first maternity leave, um, I was really worried uh, about missing out on opportunities, people coming up around me. Um, and whilst I didn't have a mentor, I did confide in somebody because I think there's a stat out there that like um, in your first three years or as a returning mum, 13% of people will get a promotion rather than about 36% me 36 of men in the same time period will get promoted and so there's a massive discrepancy between again returning mums to work and their future progression and I think there's lots of just stuff going on me so um, yeah I think again at your different life stages to your point you will potentially need different people to give you different things so just always check check on yourself in terms of what potentially you might need. I know we've not got to the other questions now all the hands go up we've run out of time I'm so sorry but don't worry because we've got an hour's worth of lunch plenty of networking I know everybody on this stage I'm speaking on your behalf but I'm sure you'll be uh, more than happy for people to come up and ask direct questions so please make sure you do and thank you for all being fantastic and and listening and I really hope you've got something out of the session thank you